Let's go. Hey, welcome to the latest edition of First Day Copets podcast. It's episode nine already of season three. Uh, this is a podcast for supporters of Liverpool in Delaware and those friends of uh, supporters in Delaware, of which we have several uh, on hand today. Uh, thanks for listening on your preferred platform. We're available on all of those things, Apple, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. This week, we're really excited to be joined by Jake Lotter, who is our first Canadian guest. He is from the Supporters Club in Toronto, um, a very fine city. I'm sure we'll talk about Toronto as we go along. Uh, joined, really pleased to be joined by Haitham from Chicago and Daz from Baltimore. Um, one more time. Um, Sean. Uh, is this had, the last time? What's that? Is that the last time? Because you made it sound a bit ominous <laughs> there. One more time. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a week by week thing. You know, we, we're just evaluating performances and, you know. You know. <laughs> it's not us, it's you. How the defensive line was working. And uh, uh, so, we'll, we'll again, we'll talk about that, that, that later. Missing Sean this week, who's celebrating something with somebody in his family. Um, anyway, let's, let's, let's get started. We'll spend the first part of the show uh, talking about Jake's Liverpool experience and uh, the sports club in Toronto. And then we'll get to talking about last week's performances. Uh, we are recording this on September 26th, day after Liverpool drew 3-3 at Brentford. Um, some of the people in this audience, I know, were not surprised by that result, and maybe some others of us were. Um, we'll talk about that. And then week ahead, uh, Champions League's back. And then next Sunday, uh, probably the biggest game since crowds uh, disappeared. Um, we're home to Manchester City. Let's start with Jake. Um, Okay, and uh, I'm going to go to Daz and Hytham for their questions, but I'm going to start with what, what's your, what's, your, what's the story about the sports club in Toronto and your engagement with it? Yeah, so um, hi guys, um, thanks for having me on. Um, so essentially from the Toronto perspective, uh, we've been an official OLST since 2001. Um, we just had our AGM actually yesterday, um, and so now I am the new president and we have a new structure uh, in place for Toronto, which is great. Uh, we have some really good momentum um, starting off. Um, you know, for, for the last couple of years of COVID, we didn't charge any fees. Uh, we just kind of put the word out to, to you know, it's a tough time to get to do that premise. Uh, but now we've, we've had a concerted effort to grow our fan base. And right now for the first month or four weeks, we have about 200, 200 paid members. Our goal is to get 300 or so this calendar year because we realize uh, in growing that membership base, um, you can start to get, you know, money for events and essentially my, my goal is to you know when COVID is over to have a player come in the first six months and a player to come in the second six months of, of every year moving forward awesome. and so we have enough revenue to cover that and, and grow our membership accordingly. So we just moved into a new pub uh, well in the middle of last year I suppose um, our, our previous pub held about 350 people uh, scallywags but due to COVID that, that shut down. So we found a new pub called the Madison and the Madison holds 1300 people. So can you imagine on a, on a, on a match day, you know, post COVID, you know, ramming a place like that and there's TVs in the, in, all over the place. Like literally there are TVs in the loo, there's TVs like on the, and the patios, there's TVs everywhere. So, um, so the space is really conducive to, to watch sporting events. And, and we're just kind of putting our stamp on things. We're starting to put our paraphernalia up on the walls. We're trying to get this and, and grow our membership base completely. So, so that's our kind of uh, where we stand from Toronto. Uh, we basically have a, a, a you know, a few pillars like the digital content folks we've got some multimedia folks we've got established everything and we realize when we're putting content out in, the, in in our space and we do it in a in a timely fashion we are getting a lot of correspondence back from a lot around the world we've got some a lot of google metrics and things so hopefully in the next couple of years we do actually get to those thresholds of like a thousand you know fifteen hundred people and if you've seen our ultimate goal actually is like if you've seen in the raptors if you ever seen the jurassic park in front of the front of the stadium which they would have a huge stadium there's like usually like 10,000 people outside you know those are kind of our stretch 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 goals but you know imagine you know being in like in Madrid and those other places with a big tv and and having you know all your friends and family around you singing the same thing and watching the same thing so those so there's some those are some of our our our, our, our goals for the future that sounds sounds really awesome where, where are you actually in, in Toronto so um, our so if you so on, off, off of Bloor Street in Spadina basically is our pub. So it's uh, it's just it's basically a University of Toronto pub. Okay. Um, and it's been around for it's a really it's basically two massive houses, um, and and like you can think of it from a frat house perspective, like two massive houses that are stuck together basically with some aisles. 
And so there's every little nook and cranny is there's, there's a patio or place or tables. Um, and so it's just basically downtown Toronto, Bloor and Spadina, uh, uh, right close to the U of T campus. Okay. Is, that, is that near where the, um, whatever the MLS Toronto team's called? Yeah, so it's not far. So our Toronto FC, it's about a 10 minute, 10 minute subway car-ish or, or cab okay. ride, Uber ride away from there. So it's not that far. Right. Thank you. That's that's purely for my own interest because I've been to Toronto a couple of times. Um, so, um, do you guys have any any kind of restrictions nowadays on um, just attending the pub and? Uh, yes. The so this past weekend was a very very interesting premise because um, you you also have a COVID test on your on your phone. You you scan a QR code. You go through the premise, and then you you go through I think seven or eight questions. Have you left the country? All the you know, uh, do you have symptoms? You go through this, then you get a green shield. But this past weekend was the first time that they they constituted like a vaccine passport so you had to show them your proof of vaccination one shot two shot and in order to be able to come into the place and it was a very interesting premise because for the last few games um while we're kind of figuring some of that out and i you know, i'm not no hate to the anti-vax space you know whatever to each is your own and that's not my my premise but regardless it was very socially awkward to be in in the space and not know some of these details so now it's it's an interesting vibe that knowing the people, at least in this space, have gone through those checks and balances in order to be around the community. And then they're taking their own you know, status uh, caution, cautionary approach. And so we all are. So it's just a completely different perspective to be around um, folks that were in the same mindset, which was really, really good. And I think this weekend there was about 220, I think, yesterday at the pub, which wasn't too bad. Nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you have a question, Daz, about uh, uh, Toronto Supporters Club. Uh, yes. And, um, so I was in a podcast many years ago. Sorry, I, it was before you guys were around. So, um, And I heard that the Arsenal Supporters Group is pretty big up there. So, so if I was to send two boxes of knives, one to the, the Liverpool Toronto Supporters Group and one to the Arsenal Supporters Group, who could I bet on to come out on top? So... With respect to that, so like from an organization standpoint, we are literally the best in the city, right? There's a few Italian, there's a few Italian ones. There's a UV one that's pretty strong. I definitely want to send knives to them. No, but <laughs> uh, but from the Arsenal P P Supporters Club, their pub doesn't even open to watch seven o'clock matches. So the, the first game is 730 matches. Okay. And, and so this pub that we are in opens whenever we want them to open. Right. And so imagine that you're not really making a lot of revenue at 730 in the morning. You're, you're barely serving breakfast. Fine. Our, 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 our Toronto lot first call for alcohol is nine o'clock in the morning now, which has recently changed last year. However, they don't even open their pub. So they didn't even get to watch half the games that are early on. Right. So, so and also they are a supporters club, but they're not really a supporters club. There's just a few guys in a pub and they just hope to get together. So they are sporadic and we are a completely organized outfit and they are not. So I, I feel sorry for them from that standpoint, but Hey, look, that's how they are on the table as well. So that's just how they run things globally. And so it is, it is what it is. And, and I'm fine with that. I don't need to send knives. You just stuck one in right there. <laughs> it's good that the mid table teams have a supporters group though. Right. That's right? Good, encouraging. Um, so, so on, actually on the same note, um, there's a lot been written in the last two weeks. This is not about knives. This is about supporters groups. Um, there's, there's a lot been written, obviously, about Manchester City supporters base. It, it, is there a supporters club? There, there probably is a supporters club in Toronto. But how much evidence of Manchester City supporters have you seen? So there are clubs um, or pseudo factions all across the city. Uh -huh. Because you can, you can understand over the last, you know, 100 years or so, let's say, there's been many expats coming to Toronto and, and Canada as a whole. So, you know, whatever their, their premise is and whoever they like, they're, they're going to try to find that, that group set to follow. So they, there is also a Manchester City Supporters Club. Like there's a Brighton one. There's a few, there's a few one. There's a, there's a Biters one as well. Like there, there are a few here and there, right? Again, they're not as an established. The, the biggest, uh, the most established one from a longevity standpoint is the Rangers one. Rangers one have their own building. They have their own pub. It's a Rangers pub. It's a very different premise. Someone gave them a load of cash and they bought a pub and that's theirs. And so it's a completely different dynamic than us going to somebody else's facility. So, yeah. so that's, that's, an, that, you know, maybe one day we'll get there, but um, yeah, there are lots of different um, 
uh, supporters clubs around the city. And we're trying to get like next year, hopefully like five aside tournament against them. Right. We're trying to do, we're trying to start off with a five aside tournament and if it goes well and we don't break ankles and, you know, people can go to work the next day, then maybe we'll go to an 11 outside and see how that goes. Because I really want to next year go to the five aside in Holland with all the other OLSCs. So if we can start to get to that premise going, then we can just, you know, get some um, um, support and, and, and some fees get going together. Then we can send some folks up there and, and have some fun. But yeah, well, hope Sean Costello from last week's listening because you know he he could start our Delaware five aside team. He, uh, but uh, anyway, just thank you for your sharing what's going on in in in, in the city. Um, I'm gonna like turn it over unless anyone's got another question about the supporters club. So like, how did you become a Liverpool fan? Um, so I was born in London, right? I was born in Hounslow. I was with just a stone throw away from Heathrow. Mm-hmm. My local is actually Brentford. Mm-hmm. So like literally my grandmother's house, I can throw a stone to Brantford's pitch and it's right there. So this was a very interesting perspective of yesterday's match. Um, I know that they're, you know, they're a good squad, but nevertheless. Um, so I, so I was, I grew up, um, I, I came to Toronto basically when I was five years old um, um, in the early seventies. And essentially at that point in time, seventies, eighties, I started to play footy. And I started to like see things and st- see stars and see, and then red came to my mind. And then I was like, okay, I like this. And I was looking like, which, which red? And I like this red. And I was like, okay, I went to Liverpool and I, I chose that. And then I started to grow up a little bit. And then I, I really like the premise of, of having like, you know, Gail as one of the, the premier, you know, a multicultural um, players that was signed for Liverpool. And that helped me grow up in the city playing football as a minority seeing this club that I like is already doing those types of things so then you know as soon as that started to happen they took my allegiance and I and I was a fan ever since from the, from those standpoint early on it was kind of and then as soon as that happened I was like okay this is my squad and then of course we were winning everything at the time anyways but yes that was that's basically the story I find it really disturbing actually to read how you talking about Howard Gale right the mm. Mm-hmm. I found it disturbing to read about like some of the abuse that he suffered from his own teammates. Yeah. Um, at which, um, you know, I, I, th- I think is a bit of a stain on, on like our like history, but I feel like we, 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 we upped our game nicely through the eighties with some of the players who played for us. And, you know, it didn't hurt that John Barnes is possibly one right. of the greatest players ever to play for us. Right. But yeah. uh, I, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that, through that period where well, we weren't necessarily great. Um, yeah. So, uh, so fast forward a couple of years, uh, or, or maybe not, really interested in what's your favorite Liverpool memory? So um, I'm going to have to say Istanbul, right? So when I was at the pub, yeah. I barely got into the pub, the, the old one, the Skylywags, it was packed. Yeah. So essentially the main floor was, there's three levels. The main floor is packed. The bottom floor is packed. And I, I knew the owner. And I was like, can you just let me and a few people in? Just anywhere. We don't care. And so we found that he brought us to the second floor, which was kind of like a storage area. Right. And there was one tap there. And the, the TV, I kid you not, was just like a little tiny thing. And six of us were around that TV. And then by the time the first couple goals started happening, I just was into the sauce and the the pictures could not come fast enough because of my my sadness of what was happening and I was like oh my god we've got to this point in my lifetime and now I see this and I'm just getting annihilated and essentially as the you know the next goal is happening beer that same beer is flying around the room and then it gets more and more and more intense and then that was basically that night I don't think I slept and we were up and down the streets of Toronto, basically, you know, jumping for joy and just honking our car horns and running with flags all over. We were we were stopping traffic like it was just a different scene. Police had to come. There was flares. There was all kinds of things. And and basically it was such a really good premise. And then it was a really good mixture of expats and like people from around the, the world of LGBTQ folks. There was everyone disabled folks there. So it was a really good inviting atmosphere. But I'm lucky that I got to see it with those because you could hear them singing from up the upper floor and the bottom floor. And I was like, I'm gutted because I'm stuck here. So I'm, you know, me and six guys are trying to sing, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm gutted because that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. But nevertheless, that was, that was basically 
one of my best moments in the last little while. We're watching that, getting to that point, going to the penalties, and just I, I don't even know how much beer I drank that day, but you know, I know the bill was a few hundred dollars just for myself. <laughs> so I'm not a small guy by any stretch of the imagination. I'm like, I'm 6'2, 250 pounds. So, you know, I can handle my my pops, but that day was a that was day was a different story for sure. That, that's uh, that's better than my story. But uh, I, I did notice that Jurgen Klopp actually referenced this game a couple of weeks in an interview, and he said that he he almost turned it off after the first half, um, which which I related to very well. Um, Walk uh, out. What's that, Daz? Walk out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we'll talk about this. But honestly, his management yesterday. Come on. Um, so, any 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 more questions for for Jake? Yeah, I got, I got one. So uh, just going back a little bit, um, you know, you talked about the uh, 70s, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, what are some of the players that you followed uh, from back then? Uh, I know um, Paul mentioned Barnes was my favorite player of all time, but just curious about yours. Well, I, I, all of them basically, right? But like from the Canadian side of things, I really enjoyed Bruce, right? So Bruce, because, you know, he had his heyday and he did his work, but he was in Canada for quite some time. Like he married a Canadian girl. He was the Ottawa Fury coach, goalkeeping coach. So he was always coming to our pub. Like he was always coming to our pub. And he moved to the Maritimes, like the east coast of Canada for a bit before he's he's back into Liverpool. But he would always come to the pub and he has stories upon stories. And could he have a pint or two, right? So, and then, and then also like one of my favorite folks was like Kennedy, right? Like basically Kennedy, right? From that, from that time, I'd never seen a man drink as much beer as that man can drink in like three minutes. And I was just shocked. And then just looking at his medals, like I know I've seen them on TV and I'm seeing him play in those, in those, in those moments. And then I'm seeing the medals of, of history in front of my face. I'm like, wow, this is like, this is super cool. I'm like, you know, and I can picture in my mind him going through these games and playing these games and on these opponents. And I was just like, this is phenomenal. Like, this is great. Right. And then also we've got, we've brought in a few flares as well. Like our last people, our last folks from uh, that we were able to bring in before COVID was John Barnes and Steve Nichol were here in Toronto. Right. So we brought them here and the John was coming anyways. Uh, and we, fought, I don't know how we got Steve to come, come and join him. And we almost had, we, we almost had Bruce in there as well, but that didn't, that, that couldn't get organized. And then John did his rap and, you know, so from our standpoint, it was great and they'd sang songs. And so, yeah, some of those players is, is, you know, I like them all though, almost right. Like literally it's hard to say, you know, uh, not watching any of them, but I like basically them all because it helped me to, to solidify, uh, you know, loving the team even more because of the players, because they're so hard, right? Like they, they went through so much adversity to to get to the challenges and win, but yeah. You transition this in many ways. We could talk about terrible punditry from ex Liverpool players, which would be one way to go. But uh, Daz, if you if you have a question, I won't uh, I won't go down that path yet. No, no, I, did, I did I did notice your uh, your your facial expressions when uh, like how did Steve Nickel go there? It was the offer of beer, right? That's we know this. <laughs> We've got these crisps <laughs> and this beer. Yeah, it was a great show that when they were in Toronto, though. I, I really sincerely enjoyed it. We packed about 200 people, and nice. uh, it was great, yeah. And they had a good time. They were a bit knackered, but you know, they, they, we had a good time. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So um, let's let's kind of bring it up to the present. Um, you're now the most name check supporters club on the Anfield Rap, uh, I think it's fair to say. Um, so what, 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 what's happening there? Actually, what? Yeah, so we're trying to so so again before um, COVID basically started to you know be on fire, we were already we were arranging with Gibbo and Craig basically mm-hmm. um, to be part of the tour when they're coming here. So we had so much work put in. We had the place, we had flyers, we had you know we're getting ticketing sorting out. It was literally the the when 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 we started to come into lockdown, it was literally the two weeks we we're organizing flights, we we're getting all that stuff organized, and they stopped. So we've been in con. We've, I mean, we have been in contact with them for several years now, um, and so um, we were gutted that they couldn't come. So one of our head of of marketing, um, with the new structure that we have, is in Liverpool right now um, and has been for the last week. And he made it a point to talk to them. He's been on their podcast, Izaz uh, Sheikh, a few times. And so basically, he was asking me, "What do you want me to do?" I'm like, "You go there, you pitch us, you know them, you be yourself." 
enjoy the enjoy the moment and just tell them to come back basically and so you know they want to expand their north american premise right presence they yeah. do on occasion come when there's tours and things like that but they realize that you know we are growing populous and we do have an affinity towards liverpool as a whole of north america and they knew they do need to tap into this market and so this would have been a great you know that tour would have been great for them to kind of broach that subject to spread their name and get you know closer to the community so hopefully we'll get them organized again and and we'll continue to push those guys to push our names on the podcast as much as possible so we do get a more global audience to come to toronto and and, and any, anyone that wants to come to toronto please look us up at olstoronto.com uh, we will take care of you we'll you know we'll bring you to our pub we'll, we'll, we'll make sure you have a good time and then you're amongst family and friends that was awesome i'm 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 so the only thing that's putting me off is that, that I, I drove my daughter to Toronto like uh, three or four years ago. I think it was 2017. The last time I remember us drawing 3-3 against a team called Something Ford. It was against Watford away. It was first game of the season. Um, it, would just, it, it, it definitely put a bit of a damper on the trip from my perspective. So um, maybe I should just fly. Maybe that's the, the, the thing to do. Okay. Um, why don't we turn our attention to what's been going on the last week and then maybe look ahead. Um, so given you're our guest, I'll, I'll start with you, Jake. Um, well, just a brief word on, on Norwich, who I think are doomed, aren't they? They're really doomed, but, um, you know <laughs> it'd be nice to see, uh, Taki score a couple of goals, right? Dibok looked like he was someone from, I don't know, three years ago. So it's so interesting when you're talking about Div, right? So he's, he's now technically in our pseudo legend status because of what he did, right? Mm -hmm. We know his, we know who he is as a player. But it's so interesting that he's 26 years old. He's six foot three. He's got, you know, he has all the attributes, but the squad say he's one of the laziest players on uh, like in training. Right. And I can't understand that. I can't understand being in the position of a striker in a, in a first world club that you just don't hustle your heart out. Right. And sometimes I think it looks like that's the case when he's on the pitch. Right. He has all the attributes, but I just don't understand why sometimes doesn't correlate and then he becomes that third that third you know third option after i mean bobby is bobby and now jota's jota and i can kind of understand that but it's got to be gutted for him just to not be able to compete like go right like you know that's kind of been a tough thing to watch uh norwich has got some good players mind you and i do like the fact that tacky did get some goals we need some injection of new of those outside periphery players to put some pressure in, get their moments, and actually go when they have their moments. And, and Taki's had this, you know, a few injuries here and there with Southampton on loan and, and back with us again. You know, getting playing time is tough no matter what, but him to be on the score sheet twice, uh, I don't care on, what, on, on any opponent, was, was great for his own morale, right? Because then Klopp will even boost him up further and the squad, right? And then media will do the same thing. And then so hopefully he, he takes a, a, a bit of that and then, absorbs it and, and and feels it towards the next practice the next game and so on and so forth so he can continue on yeah I, you know I, I wouldn't be surprised actually if, if uh he ended up being in the team this weekend i mean that seems like a wild, wild shout but given we had some midfielders out and he has played in midfield um so 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 hi then we'll go to go to you next um quick review on norwich um no, did you see the game actually because i, know I did yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, you know I enjoyed the match. Um, I was looking forward to um, watching players like uh, uh, is it Gordon the uh, winger? Oh, Katie, Katie Gordon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, th that's that's what I wanted to do basically. Um, and and because it's that cup, the league cup, I didn't care if we won or or, or, or lost. Uh, but I I was looking forward to watching the kids, watching Kurt Kurt this uh, tacky. Um, Origi, I've, I've seen it all. So if anything, that, that was just my mindset before the game started. I knew he was playing. Um, if, if he scored, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. But it's, it's those players that I'm kind of looking forward for them to be integrated into the team, you know, this season somehow that uh, I just wanted to, um, you know, just watch him play. Uh, one thing that I mentioned, I think it was the last time we talked or the last episode, uh, just seeing our uh, midfield um, and, and then how it's thinning slowly this early um, in the season. 
um, you know, I just wanted to see how, you know, Klopp and, and uh, most probably Pep is, is, is Pep is the one that was in charge of uh, that match. Uh, we're going to, you know, have solutions in the midfield. Um, and, and the kid, I forgot his name, that came in at halftime. Or Tyler after, Morton. Yeah. Morton. Yeah, he, he seemed um, promising. I mean, again, you don't expect the world from him. You don't expect like that. Even Billy Gilmore, I thought, was uh, really good for um, Norwich, but he played for Chelsea a few times last season. So he's got that uh, experience. But uh, players like Morton, you know, I was just, uh, as soon as I say, uh, saw him on the sideline, yeah. um, you know, I got excited about it. But yeah, it, it was a good match, good result, obviously. Um, and, and, you know, uh, we got Preston uh, North End next. Um, that should be another easy match, I think. <laughs> I still think that's going to be, there's something going to change about that because clearly that's a Manchester City's draw, right? <laughs> to be away at Preston. You can't be playing a Premier League team at this stage. But Yeah, yeah. The uh, whatever apparatus that they use every year just got screwed up this time. So, uh, yeah, it's Pep's trophy. You can't do this to him. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so uh, Daz, there was one thing you, that you did talk. Actually, it's interesting. Tyler Morton came on, plays Gilmore at the game. Gilmore doesn't even end up in the team for Norwich yesterday against Everton. Thought that was really interesting. Um, but you had a couple of comments about Oxley Chamberlain's performance, and I know you weren't the only one. Um, you could go in that direction or any other, but uh, interesting new comments about Oxley Chamberlain. He played like a new dad. Uh, at least the first <laughs> off, he just and I think it was it was one of our managers said you can forget about a player the first six months after the birth of his first child. Um, he's, he's I've I love I love Alex Oxley Chamberlain. I just I love his presence. I love the way that he steps in and 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 he's a shield when he needs to be a shield and he's aggressive when he needs to be aggressive, specifically around players in in his orbit. I remember there was the one time they went off to Coutinho at a in a, um, and it was right around when he was looking to leave and they were doing an after match interview and it was him and Ox together. And Ox is like, just basically waved the, waved the, um, the reports off and basically told to go shag himself. And like, it's, I, I just love, I just love his presence, but he's such a confidence player. And if his first couple of touches or his pass, where he puts a dip on goal and he's a completely different player, but he's one of those players that seems to retract into himself when, when things aren't going his way. And you can see how frustrated he gets with himself when he comes off, his head's down, like he's, he's, he's kind of in his, he's in his own feelings a little bit. And to his credit, I'm glad that Klopp left him on for as long as he did because he pulled himself towards himself in the second half. I think he was a different proposition. He's still nowhere near the levels, at least for me, and I'm happy to be, to be argued out of this, but that since before the injury, but it just seems now that he's getting into like you can trust you can trust aspects of his own body again. He's had a good run of run of matches without getting injured. Um, I'd I'd love to see him just have a breakthrough game and and kind of make himself that that wonderful option that we have because he's one of the few like natural speedy ball carriers that we have going through the midfield. It's just sometimes he runs himself into blind alleys or his decision making is a little bit suspect or. Again, most of this I think is just will come. It's probably ring rustiness. Uh, if he yeah. does get a cup, if he does get a run of games and and he starts to build his confidence again, we'll see that old ox. But it's uh, again, like I said, it was good. It was good to see him kind of shake himself out of the reverie that he had in the first half. Because I, I was Twitter is such a horrible, corrosive, acidic place to be, especially when people aren't doing well. And like poor ox was getting slaughtered. Yeah. Um, and I, I was, I was like, had one eye closed reading most of them. Like, yeah, I agree with some of this, but I could give him a chance. And he, he shook it off and he, and he was much better in the second half. So that, that was good to see. Yeah. Well, Another good thing about, thing about that was that the, the goals that the Tucky scored were scruffy. Like, um, right. it's, and it's, I think that's something I've been crying out for. Jota's capable of that type of stuff too, is just, just being in the right place at the right time. And bundling it across, the, uh, I don't need up and ninety top bins every single time. I don't need dips uh, swooping and swerving all from outside the box. They just need to go in, and and he offered that. He did that. So I'm going to move on. Scruffy goals is my uh, kind of pivot point. Let's talk about the Brentford game because it's probably the core of what we 
probably are most focused on. Um, so, so, so Jake, I'll start with you. What was your reaction? I think there were lots of people who lost their heads on social media for lots of reasons. Um, I actually had the chance to watch the game back in a bit of calmness today. And I, I, I definitely view it differently myself now after having seen it back. But what, what was your take on that game? It was very hard to watch the defense play the way they did and having technically our first choice center backs. I mean, I know that uh, the Brentford team play aggressive football. You know, they've got a good mix of, of all kinds of folks. There's some Brits in there. There's some Danes in there. There's a good little mix of, of and they have heart. And I know they weren't going to give up. And I don't know. And, and over the last few years, sometimes we played to the level of we thought the team was at. So in that case, we know Brentford just came up. Did we think that, oh, they just came up? It's going to be a cakewalk. You know, I, I had a, a bit of, of thought when I was watching some of the stuff. I know they got a couple of scrap, crappy goals, but, you know, there was a post there. There's a few things. You know, Tony gave them a little bit of a, a, a run around. I expected our guys to do a bit better. And just the midfield, you know, I think just the whole team concept was just a little bit lacking from the pressure standpoint and just our organization. You know, I, I know we, that's, and the problem is this is an age old argument. We have um, always have immense injuries and we have, we're supposed to have a decent squad. So we have a decent squad of 15, 17 players. We should be able to be able to put one person into that or two people in that. And it shouldn't change that. The form shouldn't change that much, but I think that they, just thought, you know, it's just Brentford. They're the runner-ups last year. They got promoted. We should just, you know, and, and they played, you know, if you look at that, who they played in the first little while and what well, the toughest team was Arsenal and they beat them, right? Let's say, and, 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 and saying who was Arsenal, not, not that, you know, good of a team this year. So they're like, oh, they just played those teams. It shouldn't be easy, cakewalk. And so I think that the team let themselves down yesterday completely. Um, and I know that some of their goals were just, you know, right place, right time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But collectively, we should have got the three points. And even we were, we were already first before we played that game. And that was, that was a, the pivotal one to get those three points, right? Those, these are the options that we need to take now, right, to, to, to make sure that we're winning the league. But Yeah, I, I think it's hugely disappointing, right, to, to lose the points. But having watched the game back, I really think that most of the moments we were really – we did really well until like certain things happened and we weren't. So I think if like, so, so my take is if Jones had cut out that pass from the free kick in the first half, the, then it wouldn't have continued in quite the same way. I also think looking at it, uh, I think Matip and Van Dijk were, were like playing this really high line, which may not have been the best strategy against uh, Brentford. Um, it gave them opportunities that they're probably not going to get against Chelsea, for example, who will like sit with five people on the 18 yard line. So, um, lots of opinions in there. Hytham, what was your take? So, it just, it was a great match to watch. I, I, I enjoyed it tremendously. Um, one of the signs for me to know that I'm really enjoying the game is if, if my heart just starts pounding, you know, uh, and that was what was happening throughout the, the, the match. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it just felt like a, a few games that we've had over, you know, the club era where we either play um, a new team, um, you know, um, a team that's just coming up, or, or even, you know, in the Champions League. I know I, I read a tweet somewhere, and it uh, matched my uh, train of thought, too. Um, you know, even if you go back to the match against AC Milan, um, was it last week or the week before, um, it was kind of like that where, you know, it, it just felt like no one, at, at certain times, no one knew what was going to happen next. Um, so that's how it felt like to me. And even, you know, the Watford match that you referenced earlier, yeah. um, you know, the trip to Toronto, it was kind of similar too. So, uh, uh, you know, bottom line, I enjoyed the match. Yes, uh, we, it would have been really nice if we got the three points, but, you know, just, I don't know, a few minutes after the match was over, I was over it. And just like... Uh, Lauren Cooper, Catherine Tate's um, character uh, from her show, um, I am bothered. 
I'm above it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, um, just uh, uh, one of those matches. We tend to have one of them. Um, it's always good if we don't lose and, and draw. Like last year, it was Villa, the 7-2 match. It was kind of similar to it. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just over it. Um, I'm not going to get into tactics and all of that stuff. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I wanted to point out is um, Trent just kind of did not look like himself. I, I don't know, because he was just sick. Um, so you didn't see the, the crosses, um, the, the swift play from him, um, you know, and it's just, again, it's, it's, it's one of those matches. Yeah. I do think you're onto a lot when it so so apparently Klopp's record against teams he's played twice is like incredible. The first time sometimes he's playing people with different tactics, not always so great. I mean, I think you, you only have to look at Leeds last year, right, where we only yeah. just won four three at home. Um, and this this season, like, oh, I know what they're going to do. We can plan for that. And I think there's definitely a we need to plan for that kind of moment. Yeah, um, and, and 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 just one more point. Brentford is really a good team. Um, and, and I know Jake said, you know, Arsenal mm -hmm. is not good, but just to go in there and be, you know, that type of team. And even um, in their league uh, cup match, they thrash whoever they play 7 0. But so it's just yeah. that confidence, you know, uh, was brought in to this match as well. I know they were playing Liverpool, but still, you beat a team 7 0. You're going to have that extra edge coming in. I mean, they're definitely not Norwich, right? That's that's. They, they, I think they are going to cause teams problems, but I also think that we needed to tweak something about the way the high line was working. Um, I don't know where you're going to go with this, Daz, but uh, you're. Uh, you're so so I, I wasn't so keen on criticizing any of the defenders because I thought that um, they they were set up to play a certain way, and then were surprised at the way Brentford played. Actually, I think that's what I would put a lot of it down to. What was your take? Well, I believe on these here airwaves, I did say they would lay a glove on us, but I didn't expect mm -hmm. a three piece combo. Um, uh, I could easily, it could be as simple as the third kit curse or the curse of the third kit. It just seems like every time I won this one, yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm just like, well, you know, why it's like, well, we're playing Brentford and we're just gonna wear the yellow because we need to market this yellow jersey, yeah. Um, there was, there was, there's a there was that, that naivety that I think was there, um, but it, uh, to, to your point, but I think that this team has been around long enough. And that team that we put out was as prop full of established professionals that have been in pressure cooker situations before. So the chat about like, oh, it's a small stadium. They're really raucous crowd. I'm like, these guys eat that for breakfast. I don't necessarily think that's what it was. And to Jake's point, my dad says this all the time is, like Liverpool's problem is they generally tend to play to the level of the squad that they're playing against. And for me, it's incredible to watch that, that we can go from the 18, 19 reds or yellows in this case to the 10, 11 reds, like within the space of the same, the same 90 minutes. It's, we, we just have like these team wide swoons for like five, 10 minutes. Of, and sometimes we get lucky and we don't, and we don't get punished for it. And other times we get three put put in against us. Um, yeah, I was I was in my feelings about it. It did feel like a three three loss, considering that Mo could have and should have put us up four uh, two. The ball bobbled him a little bit, and he put it over the bar. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but that that should have been that should have been buried. And if we had to put that in, that would have broken their spine. It would have broken their spirit. But teams, I think, have gotten to the point now, and it's been said in a number of different places that if they like, listen, if we can hang with these guys and keep them within a goal, they'll give us an opportunity that we can. And it's and it's a little disconcerting that it's happened twice within the space of ten days or twelve days. Uh, it happened against uh, AC Milan. We played them off the park. They weren't even in the same stratosphere, the, the, the same zip code that we were, and they went in two one ahead. And I knew we would. I, I knew we would bring it back because we're a better team. Uh, and again, we have that experience, and we've been behind before. But this one just felt so nervy, and it, it and it rippled throughout the entire team. Both of our fullbacks were off and it makes you realize just how dependent we are on them to be seven seven and a half out of out of ten every game that they play robo when he came on against norwich kept breaking the line as well this was like it's and he did the same thing yesterday as well like he 
He wasn't closing down space as well as he used as, as well as he usually does. Those crosses shouldn't have come in in the first place. And the fact that both of those goals, their second and their third goal, came from like Trent being mobbed on the back post. Yeah. And that's that's obviously that clearly that was by design. And it's someone I think Sean said it in our chat. It's like that's not that routinely happens because they realize that if you can get put Trent on his back, he's going to be like a turtle. And it's and it happened for both of their goals. Yeah. I don't put that on him. That's like that's that's something that Montip right. should have turned around and said, "Oh shit, there it's happening again." It's already happened, but they didn't make that adjustment the second time around. And these are like again, they're full-blooded professionals. And I can't imagine Klopp went out in the second half and said at the halftime and said, "Look, just play the second half like you played the first half," because we were all over the shop. Yeah. It's like it was just like this team-wide malaise, and it it's like, ah, eh, well, so they'll clear it or that they'll just allow it to happen, and, and then because Jota didn't come back when I. I Someone said that they went to a 4-2-4. It felt more like a 4-2-3-1 when they took Jones off, just to try and preserve what, like, maybe to try and clog up the midfield a little bit more yeah. and, and maybe try and catch them on the counter with the solid speed over the top. Um, but And it worked. It worked for that five, six, seven-minute period after, he, after they, they took Jones off. Um, but it's, I think... We just again, it's like this this malaise or this complacency just sets in. It's like, I will get it and then we'll we'll spring on them. Or we'll get and we did it often enough to, to, to be able to for us to be able to say it's like, look, we've done it. You just did it for the last five minutes. I don't know why we won't be able to do it again. But again, it, it ties into Brentford's like, as long as we can hang in, as long as we can stay close, they'll give us an opportunity. And teams now are seeing that. Like we're not we're not putting things to bed. Although having said that, we have put what three goals in and five five consecutive matches now. Which yep. effectively should really put games to bed. And it has in some instances, but like teams are like, let's just hang. We can hang, we can hang, keep it close, as close as we can, and we'll try and and we'll try and spring and, and catch one. And, and and it seems to break us quite quite a lot now. I think there's still some shades of last year that like some cobwebs that we have to shake off from the pandemic. And just when you see signs of that happening, like you kind of slide back into that, like that nerviness that doesn't need to be there, because we're a much better team. Look, and we're on a Liverpool podcast, so I'm going to say this, but we're head and shoulders the best team in the league right now. Head and shoulders. Like, I, I, you can't put City up against us. I watched them yesterday. They, they, they're just not themselves. Chelsea, they played, like, they, they played a, a particularly cowardly game at home yesterday. And you can say that's how they're set up, but yep. that's, like, you played, they, they, did they take a shot on goal yesterday? Chelsea? Yeah. Maybe one. Two, yeah. Well, they might have done at the very end, but they didn't for most of the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it was just one. Yeah, one yeah. 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 So yeah. we're uh, we're yeah. head and shoulders above in terms of talent and, and capability right now. And people are like uh, are, are shitting on us. Sorry, you have to hit the button again on our midfield from the dizzy height. But we have a lot of good quality in our midfield. Yeah. Like, and again, it's 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 not with it's, these aren't kids that we're bringing through. These are kids that are like. That we these are all established professionals at this point, and and they play they they play the way that Klopp wants them to play. So so I know it being three three, it's easy to think that somehow the game was like a game of two halves or something. But having watched it back, they had a couple of moments, um, and the moments probably came down to us not being quite prepared enough in my mind to defend against that those tactics. And honestly, I, if we played that game again next week and we have the stats team working on it, I, I honestly don't think we're going to concede three goals. We'll um, smash no, I, when it goes back to Anfield. We are going to smash them when it goes yeah, back. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, the, the reverse fixture, it's, I don't think it's going to be close at all. The only thing I would say is the reverse fixture, we have no Salah, Mane or Keita, just saying. Um, I, I could play, but still going to beat them. <laughs> So or you're your dad, I don't know. Your, your dad could too. <laughs> let's let's just, just kind of move on. Uh, maybe we'll close it out here. Actually, um, the two big games coming up this week. Obviously, the biggest of them is Port. No, it's not. It's um, playing Porto on Tuesday or playing uh, City on Sunday. Um, what? What? So, so choose your poison, whichever, whichever you want to talk about. But um, we won five nil and four one the last two times we're in Porto. Uh, obviously, it means it's going to be a draw this time because um, that's been much too easy. Um, City, first time we played them with a crowd for a while. Hmm, who will that favour? Um, 
hopes and expectations around that game. So, Jake, I'll start. I'll start with you. I, um, I know they have injuries, right? And I hope they have more. Like, oh, if I can say that. City? Yeah, they've got they've got some injuries. Yeah, they've got some. <sighs> yeah. That's ball. You know, but 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 the, the, their squad is you know a, a billion dollar squad, so whatever. Right, right. And and it's I think bollocks. that and hopefully that we do rise to the occasion. I don't know who's going to be fit. But I I pray that during the Porto game, no one gets, no one picks up anything. All right, because our starting eleven is the best ever, like around and anywhere in, in the prem, and um, hopefully we 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 keep that. You know, I don't know who's gonna be who's gonna be fit. Like who's who's our midfield? Fab, Hendo, Thiago, or like what's what's our midfield gonna be? I don't I don't know who's fit and who's not fit. But um, you know, if they have if they if they have the intensity they had in the Milan game, like they were revved up in that match. And I was it was a pleasure for me to watch that until you know we had a, a couple of lapses. But if they have that energy in in tackling, you know, pressing. Moving that they moved the ball so fast, the passes were crisp that day for the most part. If they get that type of energy and they can hit them, right? Because, um, you know, they like to hold on to the ball a little bit. I don't know if you know, Kate, they still have Kevin. Kevin's, you know, De Bruyne is a fantastic player, right? That would be my key, key conduit to, to watch on that, on that side. But I know Gundogan and, and a few others are, are, are not uh, going to be available, they're, they're hurt, but nevertheless. It doesn't really matter. We should be able to smash them. You know, I'm, I'm hoping it's like at least a 3-1. If I can get a clean sheet, I would like a clean sheet if I can. But um, and that's, that's going to be my prediction for the weekend. I think we'd all... So I think we'd love the 3-0 repeat. I'd go for... I'd be happy with the 4-3, you know, <laughs> from a couple of seasons ago. Um, do we think... So, Kaitham, I'll, I'll go to you. So we're, we're passing... Porto by right because they're not going to be much of a challenge. Actually, what if <laughs> Marco Gruic is going to like? Is he going to play in that game? I don't know. Um, maybe he could show. I think he might though. Token yeah. item. What's what's your hope and expectation about City? I I'm a little. I don't want to say I'm, I'm pessimistic about it at all, but I don't think. Um, I don't know, just watching them, even when they play, um, you know, bad games, they tend, their position is just there. Um, and that's something that you can't, I haven't seen any team um, being able to change that. So uh, my only hope is is for Ake to play. <laughs> I just I want to see okay I want, I want to see the dreadlocks you know that's all yeah you know yeah um, I think I think it's we're going to win uh, but I I don't think it's going to be like a blowout uh, I mean City is City um, it's kind of like when we play Everton I, I think that rivalry is is getting up there um, and 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 uh, I just feel like it's not going to be dependent on whose form or whatever. Um, I think it's just going to be a, a match on its own. So for me, it's either going to be uh, uh, a close win for us or a draw. So I do, I do think Chelsea played into their hands, Daz. Um, so let's talk a little bit about... Um, and I don't think um, necessarily that defensively, they are um, when when kind of push comes to shove that they're as good as their record last season without crowds um, it tells us it should be. What what's your what's your take on the weekend? Are you talking about us against City? Yeah, yeah, because we passed Porto by. But, but... Apparently, like wow, it's just like Autobahn right past them. Um... So, so so just a word on Porto, by the way. Given where the table is, uh, I'm I'm thinking that a draw there's fuck completely fine because um, I think everyone's going to draw with everyone else and we're going to qualify anyway so um, well I, I, the reason I don't want to fast track right by Porto is because I'm my my question is for if everyone if I can if I can pose a question is what what team is he putting out against is he putting out against Porto because I think they'll have a direct influence on on what we see on the over the weekend because yeah. your point is like we have three in the bag whereas there was that tie between Atletico and Porto last time round. So that puts us in the pound seat. Um, I don't think that he necessarily needs to play any of his guys that started against Brentford back into form. So he doesn't necessarily want to 
throw them out there and risk picking up a knock in, in against Porto. So I think that if if he goes where I think he's going to go, and I think he might give Taki a run out, I think he might give Ox a run out. Uh, he might even let uh, Curtis play again because I, for me, Curtis did enough. And I'm wondering if that's why he didn't pull him off with well, what it's 67, 68 when, we, when he took him off. He won't enjoy that. too. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he just just he has commented on uh, he doesn't like Jones's ta- he's concerned about Jones's tactical discipline because um, he, he made a comment. Apparently, I didn't hear this that when he was playing the six against Norwich that he was tr- trying to do too much, and then when Tyler Morton came on, he was doing what he wanted. Well, that's again like you, if we could transition to to Curtis. Curtis is mm-hmm. Curtis is a touch player. Um, he likes the ball at his feet. He's Kind of, he's kind of a maverick. He's very avant-garde with what he likes to do, and that's part of what makes him who the player that he is. And you kind of have to walk that fine line between breaking him of that and, and trying to jam him into a mold and giving him and giving him his bit a little bit. So um, I can see that Klopp's very much a systems type guy. So Curtis runs a risk of becoming a, a luxury player, but you, you see this. You can see Curtis now taking on that that mantle of of, of kind of dovetailing and fitting club more closely into what he's trying to do so club to say it is like it's yes we all see it but again you can't if you want him to be kind of like that 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 um that wild horse that he is you you do have to allow him that, those moments i think putting him in a six role is very very it's not where it's not where curtis should be it's interesting that he even tried that right by the yeah yeah but again, so just to round it out, I think that for you guys, I'd, I'd, I'd put it to you guys that if, if does he does he tinker with that midfield and maybe give one of give two of the three up front a, a break, give Divock. I think Divock did enough to 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 merit a run out against Porto, maybe just for sixty minutes. So, so Jake, what? Go, I think what that, I think I think maybe I don't know maybe does Millie get does Millie get a run in? Like I think that um, I mean. From the is Curtis, he, was, is, is he injured this weekend? No, I don't. I'm not sure. On the bench, he's on the bench. Yeah, yeah. That surprises me. That the end of that match could have used a bit of Millie against Brentford. That really yeah. surprises me. In hindsight, absolutely right. Yeah. So I, I think from the Curtis perspective, what you're talking about his flair and his creativity from his thing is that kind of scouse-ish like mentality and his winning mentality in his head. So I think that's going to really, that, that, that find that fine balance from a 20 year old to kind of allow him to have that foster that creativity and grow his touches and, and, and his moves. And then having him rein into the system is going to be a very interesting challenge. Cause you know, he's a little bit of a hard, hot head. He's got a little fight in him, which we like, right. We want him to grow from that perspective, but then Klopp needs to kind of slow down there, Cowboy. We just need you to, you know, this is my system. You got to work here. This is what you have to do. You have to play for the team and then and yourself, but team first, right? So, you know, and and having that tie dialogue with like a Harvey, a 17, a 20-year-old like Curtis is is an interesting one, right? These are his basically his kids, right? He's he's scolding his kids, saying, You gotta do this, you gotta do this. Going to that premise is very interesting. I imagine in, in 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 kind of having those having that dialogue for sure, right? I think that you know um, the all the men- all the players that you guys mentioned have have a place into in that squad. I'm assuming that Gomez and and maybe Kanate get the get the start, right? I liked I liked um, that that pairing was good. I think Samikas gets a run in as well. I think um, he didn't play too he didn't play too badly as well. I don't know if you want to like how much you want to change that squad. Do you change mm-hmm. seven guys or eight guys, or do you just say, you know what, I'm only going to change three, four tops. You know, get some structure, and and hopefully we can come out of it without any injuries, which is again the key piece, right? We want to keep the like, people. You know, um, Curtis can run. He's 20. He can play four games like one after the other. That's fine, right? But uh, some of the elder statements, you know, you kind of want to put them in a blanket and. And, and cover them up, but we'll see. I just uh, w- one last point, Paul. Um, I know you need to move on, but uh, oh. Por- Porto is not the same team um, that we beat um, five zip and four one. Uh, Porto is a better team. Better um, than that. Yeah, okay. but better better than those teams that we played a few years ago and beat the crap out of. Um, I mean, last year I think they made it to the uh, last 16 or last eight, I can't remember. Last eight, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Juventus was shit. I mean, let's be honest. So <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, I just, 
I, I think that they got better players and, and they got rid of Militao too. So yeah, yeah. You know. So so if we can have a free kick against them, then you know if, if someone does a Ronaldo, then clearly they're gonna beat us. Or if you remember that from last year where the ball came up Ronaldo's height head and he moved out the way and it went in. That's that's what beat anyway. Um so but you know, so so you have a serious point, right? That they've got a more solidified team than the one perhaps that we played against previously, even if last year's uh, round of 16 wasn't the best evidence to support that. So, they, did so, hold, they did hold uh, Atletico who had no, no slouches. Right, right. They should have won that game actually, Porto, shouldn't they? I thought they had, like, they did have chances, right? I, d- I do think, so I'll, I'll, we'll do one more round and then we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Um, I, I, I do think that, that essentially Tuesday's team will depend a lot on who he plans to play on Sunday. I know there's quite a gap between those games, but uh, you know, I, I, I think the shouts about Canate, Gomez, and Shamikas are, are entirely possible based on who he wants to play and what, how he wants to frame that last game. Um, so, so let's look ahead. You can, um, you know, you can go off a complete tangent here if you want to. But uh, what, what, one final thought maybe about this weekend, about looking ahead, about your sense of optimism, about kind of where we are as a team, about how terrible some of the commentary is on NBC, which is a constant theme that we talk about. Uh, I don't know if you, I, no, actually, I don't know where you get your, who does your commentary on, in Canada. That's a, so we, we get the BN Sports. We have the BN Sports one, right? The Dazen one. Oh, okay. We, we have, we, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, nevertheless, but uh, that's that's our crew. That's that's on the on the matches. And so you we do, get... we do on on. We have had NBC um, uh, Sports Channel a couple of times here and there, but it's like no no hating on on some of the American the dynamic, but some of that commentary is just brutal. It's just like you know, I'd rather put on the Spanish one, and I don't speak Spanish. I don't really care. Like just some of that stuff is just. So you got to be kidding me. Like this is just you're 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 draining me. I want to watch this. I want you to be happy for this premise. You can be unbiased. I don't care, but just put your head in the match and do the right thing. You know, yeah. don't spoil my two hours of happiness that I look forward to every single week. Like, do not do that for me, please. Right. So I I do not enjoy some of the American punditry for sure. Yes. But you no, know, nevertheless, I, I sometimes we change it to the Spanish channel or whatever else just because we just can't deal with it anymore. But feels like you may have listened to a few previous episodes of our podcast actually because that's been a bit of a theme like how much better is it so so jake looking forward what's your hope for this week um maybe even predictions which i'm not a big fan of but i think that if you check if you, the the porto match again i know we're looking past them i don't want to do that because mm-hmm. again that kind of has that brentford premise like you yeah. know we're not thinking about brentford we're thinking past that but we can't do that in football but I think that if he doesn't chop the team up too much and we just need to put a solid team out um, and, and just squeak, I don't care what it is, 2-1, 3-2, 3-1, I don't really care, 1-0. You no, know, we just need to just, you know, make it easy for ourselves if we can, right? We have the players. Can they, can they just be clinical when we need them to be clinical, right? They've taken, you know, 70% of the chances, but they could just take that one more and just put the pressure off the whole team. Hopefully they can do that in this match. And then looking forward to the city one, you know, I think that, you know, the, the, I don't think that they're as strong defensively, but, you know, I think, for, for, sorry, city as strong as, as they are defensively. I think they've got some issues with respect to that. And I think that we can tackle them and, 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 and run over that midfield. Um, and we should be able to, you know, Fabinho and Rodri, like whoever plays there uh, from, from those perspectives, I think we should, we should be able to do some justice and come out with the win. And hopefully from a Be- Becker perspective and a team confidence, we can get a clean sheet as well. Love the idea of a clean sheet. Thank you. Um, Hytham. So I'm going to go, yeah, I'm going to go uh, on a tangent, um, not related to our matches or Liverpool. Um, I'm a, a big sucker for uh, success stories, pretty much. And uh, Raul Jimenez scored today his first goal after that crazy injury. So I, I was happy for him. I, I've always liked him. I like watching him. And could see how he was struggling and, and you know, just uh, trying to score for the past, I don't know, ever since he got back in. It was good to see him score today. So that was uh, uh, a good watch for me. 
Good shout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see him. Yeah, good to see him back. Even though they kind of stole the Bobby song for, for him, which I'm a bit not okay about. But anyway. There's another team, actually. That There's another team. It. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. It was like recently. Thing. It was one of the recent matches that we had. I don't know if it was Leeds or somebody or some Norwich. Somebody did the same thing, which was like, go get your own stuff. Right. Flattery is the greatest form of imi- whatever it is. Yeah, anyway. Imitation, flattery, something to do with Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, last word with you, Daz. 2-0. I think we win this weekend 2-0. That's after battering Porto or just sneaking by a Porto? Weak. Yeah. I, I, do, I do think it's going to be a much harder game for City because I think Chelsea played totally into City's hands thinking they could hit them on the break. Um, that's the last word for me. Jake, it was awesome to have you join us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Our, our first Canadian episode, hopefully of, uh, of many going forward. Um, yeah, for sure. Do come to Toronto as well, please. Any of you, anyone listening, any any Liverpool fan uh, or on, uh, you know, please come find us at our new pub, uh, the Madison Avenue, and find us on the web, uh, olsctoronto.com, and uh, we'll completely sort you out. We we'll look forward to to bringing in some new people into the city for sure. Oh, by the way, Thanks. look for the look for the cutlasses because I I, I looked at the uh, looked at the shipping costs. It's actually cutlasses are cheaper to send than knives, so. I'm going to send up cutlasses. But not to the Juve fans, right? Just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. So thank you for listening uh, on whatever podcast platform you are. And if you watched on YouTube, uh, you probably should have done the podcast. Uh, but <laughs> thank you so much. All right. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thanks again. Bye for now. Thank you.